For this lecture, I want to introduce you to a number of case studies of ancient sustainable methods of resource utilization. So these are um, little stories from um, indigenous cultures, land-based cultures that have harvested resources from their local environment for um, long, long periods of time in a relatively sustainable manner. And what we do with permaculture is um, a number of things, and one of them is look at ancient land-based cultures, some of them still practicing those old techniques, some of them not anymore, and look at some of those methods and incorporate some of those sustainable methods into our current designs. Um, for example, one of the first um, ones we'll talk about here is um, an ancient culture that's been um, existing in Northwest um, United States, Southwest Canada, um, the Haida Gwaii, and there they have lived there sustainably harvesting fish from the sea and other resources in a manner which um, ensures that the future harvest will remain viable. So they're not depleting their resources over the long term. They're able to manage those through certain techniques. And any land-based culture that has had to exist within a, a localized area with finite resources will pretty much automatically become more sustainably focused because they're not gonna do methods that deplete their resources that will be available to them in the next year. They're going to practice and refine their methods so they ensure that they'll have resources to survive. And if uh, cultures did not do that, they're not around anymore and their methods um, you know, just did not, did not survive or exist. So we're looking at those um, those cultures that actually um, had success at this. So as I said, one of the first ones is the Haida Gwaii people that live in southwestern Canada, northwestern United States, what are now those countries. They lived there before these countries existed. They were the first peoples uh, of the Canada area, um, in the southwest Canada region, and they live on an island off um, of the coast of Canada and north of Vancouver Island. And the, the methods they use um, to harvest salmon, uh, like I said in the last slide, they ensured that the future harvest would be, um, would be equally as good, if not better, every year. So they improved the salmon harvest with their methods. They did not deplete the fishery resources. I got a chance to go and visit and learn from some of the Haida Gwaii people when I was um, at a conference up in southwestern Canada and learned about these techniques. Um, so I'm relaying them to you what was told to me. This is pretty much typical of the Haida Gwaii environment. The people were coastal people, but they lived in the forest um, and they did not always stare at the ocean or have access or view of the ocean. So they mostly got their resources and they took their um, environmental cues from the forest. And one of their main food sources is salmon and it's part of their their food system it's part of their cultural system it's part of the even their spiritual system the salmon was so important to them and it was such a um, you know a base food type that if they did not have it that would have a lot of negative repercussions for their culture and their population so it it, it tapped into their livelihood and their survival which is connected to spirituality for most cultures so they were forest dwelling for the most part when I did take this um, field trip and got to talk to some of the people in their native territories, they were um, kind enough as to, they had already fished and harvested some of the salmon, but they smoked it the old way, um, just over a fire. These are the, the salmon heads um, and gave us lunch after they talked to us all about their um, ancient, um, but also contemporary methods that persisted from ancient times until now of salmon harvesting. Here's an example of the type of um, salmon harvesting that was done in that area by the Haida Gwaii. And generally, the Salish uh, is a, a larger group of, a larger cultural group that they're part of. This is Vancouver Island um, nearby. But the red oval is showing you of the migration of the salmon in the spring. They would start to move south as the waters warmed up as they went south, and they would go back to their spawning grounds. And the Haida Gwaii people 
like this picture shows, they would be living mostly on the forest and in the land, and they didn't have time to go out you know, every day or every couple of hours within a day to go find out if the salmon um, school of salmon had, was coming by for them to harvest and fish. And that would be a really uh, efficient time to go get a lot of fish. Um, and so they didn't have time to row out and see if there were salmon and row back. You know, they had to use other cues and they learned um, other methods, which I call ecological cues, other uh, um, things going on in the ecosystem that were tied to the salmon migration that let them know the salmon were, um, were out in the waters outside their home in a particular time. So one of the ecological cues that I was told about was this um, wild lilac. So that grows in the forests and in the mountains there near the coast. And it was around their villages and around where they spent most of their time, the Haida Gwaii people and other Salish groups that live in the area. And they, would, they noted that, um, you know, this is over a long period of time, study and observation, they saw that when the wild lilac was in bud, this picture is showing you when the buds, the flower buds have bloomed, they've opened. If you can see kind of in the very center at the very bottom, there's some flower buds, unopened flowers. So when the, the wild lilac was in bud, that was the time to go out and get the salmon. They knew the salmon was migrating past their area at that time, and that would denote the proper time to go harvest. There were fish to harvest, and there were the particular <clears throat> um, portion of that school of salmon that were targeted for harvesting at that time by those wild lilac buds. So if you were a Haida Gwaii person or of Salish descent living on an island like here, showing you Vancouver Island, and you wanted to know when it was time to go out and um, fish for the salmon, you would have noticed the wild lilac in bud in your village, and then you would have paddled out and what you would have paddled out into was that migrating school of salmon coming by, going south, and you would have um, been immersed yourself or gone into the tail end of that population of migrating salmon. You would not be um, paddling out into the, the very forefront where the stronger, younger, reproductive fish were, or even the mid part, but the tail end where the slower, weaker, genetically weaker and slower, and older and non-reproductive and even sicker fish would be swimming. So every year their harvest indicated by that wild lilac cue would be taking out um, the fish that were weaker genetically, as I said, and older, and it didn't compromise the overall health and vigor of that population. In fact, it improved the genetics of the population of salmon throughout the years by taking out the genetically weaker and slower fish. And the people got their, their meat and they harvested in a way that strengthened the, the population of the fish. And there was reciprocity there, but it was all because of this well-honed um, ecological cue telling them exactly when to go to take the exact portion of the population that would ensure the long-term sustainability of their resource use. Now, to go a little further into kind of that method and, and talk about why they did this. Well, again, they're trying to sustain their own food source, but there, there is also more to it than that. They, they wanted to reciprocate. They wanted to help the fish and they wanted to help themselves. And it was a give and take. So it wasn't just to sustain the amount of fish they could take every year. It was, um, it was thought to be a close relationship between the salmon and the Salish people and um, it was more of a helping, a mutual helping, than it was about um, just resource um, extraction efficiency. So that's the story, the first kind of ancient method of sustainable harvesting from a land-based culture that we can look at in this lecture and possibly remember in some way when we're doing our permaculture designs to be able to um, hone in on these small ecological cues that can help all of us learn to more efficiently use the resources that we have. The second case study is from the Miamia people who are in the upper Midwest or lower Great Lakes region of the United States. And I've worked extensively for about 21 years with this um, indigenous community 
And one example of sustainable harvesting or agriculture is their corn planting. And again, we're, I'll be telling you about some ecological cues they learned to make sure that their harvest would be successful. The Miamia and other cultures in the upper Midwest and Midwest lived um, in uh, areas where there were prairies. You're seeing a small prairie opening here in the otherwise massive um, matrix of eastern deciduous forest. And uh, many cultures, including the Miamia, um, mostly lived on the edge of the prairie where they had access to the forest resources and um, protection and the prairie resources and open game hunting and easy to see um, game and enemies coming and things like that. So they kind of were able to utilize the um, diversity of species uh, that lived in the prairie and the forest and kind of maximize their ability to acquire those resources. One of the things they also learned um, uh, over um, a long ago, but it was built into their culture long ago was the cultivation of corn that um, as far as we know, came up from Central America, um, Mexico, Mesoamerica. It migrated on trade pathways from there. And um, they cultivated corn as very much part of their culture. I've studied a lot of their ancient language and their, that's the same as their current language, but the ancient um, archival records talk a lot about how they knew when to plant. So as opposed to these days when we think about like kind of calendar year, like what dates are good for planting certain crops, the Miamia didn't have that per se. They had a lunar calendar and they also didn't um, necessarily just look at lunar dates for when things should happen. They looked at the ecosystem. They took in um, many factors to decide when to plant the corn. And one of the ways that, that helped them with that was looking at animal behavior during certain times of the year that would cue them to when to plant. This is an Eastern whippoorwill and they have a very distinctive call. I have a, a little link there that hopefully works for you to hear their call if you don't already know it, but it doesn't exist out here in, the, um, in California in the Southwestern United States. So check that out. Um, and the name of this bird was Wikuya and Wikuya is the, in the Miamia worldview sounded like the call of that whippoorwill bird. Um, it's not horribly different than our word whippoorwill. Um, and uh, that bird would start making its call. It does it at dusk and into the early evening. It will start to call to um, call in mates. And um, it does that when the temperature gets warm enough in the springtime. So it's usually when the night temperature stays above 40 degrees Fahrenheit and which indicates that the soil temperature is um, not freezing, the soil's not frosting or freezing, and it's warm enough that you can plant and it will not freeze or kill your seeds or seedlings as they germinate. So um, the, the lunar month in the Miamia uh, lunar calendar is called Wikuya, and Wikuya is what they um, said this bird is named and in the Miamia language means time to plant, time to go planting. And that means of the corn. So when they heard the whippoorwill, the Wikuya call in the early to, um, excuse me, the late spring, whenever it got warm, consistently warm, that the air was warm enough and the soil was warm enough and the, warm enough for the bird to think it's safe to nest now, my eggs won't freeze kind of thing. Then they, um, they were literally told in their language by the bird, go plant, it's time, spring is coming, I'm gonna be nesting, you need to be planting, let's go. So that's another really kind of, I think, elegant ecological cue that pulls in a lot of data to, to help the Miamia know when is the proper time to successfully plant. Another important plant resource for the Miamia was asapa or Indian hemp. It's a plant that grows in a large patch in the, the prairies and grasslands of their territory in northern Indiana. And it was um, a plant that is used to make 
cordage out of. So it has really nice strong fibers in it and it's woven into string, rope, uh, nets, fish nets, deer nets, and it provides a very strong cordage. How that was harvested was another unique way that a sustainable use of a resource. And I'll talk to you about that in the next slide. This is an image of an Indian hemp clone. So that red patch of, of sticks in the center there is a um, opossum cannabinum clonal patch. So there's hundreds and hundreds of above ground stems that are all connected underground for this Indian hemp. And that Indian hemp is um, periodically harvested and sometimes burned on purpose to regenerate the Indian hemp and provide more stems um, for more production of fiber. So fire and the way that the Miami people have harvested this particular plant for, the, for use as creating cordage and fiber and deer nets and fish nets traditionally has been by um, harvesting it in a way that um, that increases more production the next year. So if it's harvested after the first frost, then it's put all of its reserves underground, this particular plant. And so the Miamia knew that and they would harvest it at a time when it was not harmed at all by being harvested and they would not harvest all of it um, and they was also periodically burned the prairie, which rejuvenated the soil and rejuvenated those clones. So they were thriving and often grew bigger the next year. But at least um, the way that they were harvested and burned, it sustained the production of these um, clones of Indian hemp and sustained their um, procurement of the resource of these fibers to be used as cordage. The Miamia knew about um, ecological succession, what ecologists now call ecological succession, was a dynamic and a process that was well known to the Miamia and many other indigenous cultures throughout the world. They knew that when a fire or some other type of disturbance, a landslide, a flood occurred, um, it often resets the whole ecosystem back to a younger stage and different types of plants would grow early on in that stage. Um, like if a forest was cut down or um, a prairie burned, something like that. Younger, more quick growing, weedy type of plants grow first to kind of reestablish the, the land and the vegetation, often called pioneer species, and which would lead to uh, building of the soil and more shrubby species coming in and often trees later. And that's what's now called ecological succession. But um, the Miamia, and like I said, many other land-based cultures use this, um, th their knowledge of this process to their advantage in, in agriculture and um, to create better hunting grounds. The prairies in the Midwest, and especially the upper Midwest, have um, a tendency to become forested if they're not um, burnt by either wildfire or in this case, we're talking about the indigenous set fires, purposely keeping the prairies as prairies and not becoming forest, kept them um, a better place to hunt game. Um, also, it protected all the very different species that lived in the prairie that were useful for the Miamia, the medicinal plants and other plants like these fiber plants. So um, burning was something that was natural for these habitats too. And it often rejuvenates the soil as well. So it was again, a reciprocity between the Miamia and their land. They, they did a, a technique, a method of caring for it and managing it that benefited the plants and the animals, including themselves and helped the ecosystem overall stay healthy as well. Another really interesting look at indigenous knowledge as a way um, to guide sustainable management is from the island of Palau in Micronesia, South Pacific. Um, one of my professors in graduate school did a lot of research there when he was younger um, for his dissertation. And he spent a couple of years there and speaking with a lot of the elders and trying to understand um, the nature of the sustainable fisheries on Palau. A lot of the village elders really spent a lot of time with close observations of different aspects of um, their environment, including the position of the sun, the rising and setting of stars, the moon, 
um, coming up, and waxing and waning, and ebbing and flowing of the tides and wind directions, different heights and um, characteristics of the wave break breaking on the, the waves breaking on the reef, natural smells within the village and how those change during the day, during the season, from year to year, and life cycles of organisms within the lagoons um, around the island. As you can see in the picture, there's lots of interesting lagoons. So um, synthesizing all those observations, the, um, the local indigenous people um, would find um, ways to predict all kinds of things, fish populations increasing or decreasing. Um, that was the main thing that they used a lot of these cues for the, um, how these, all these came together. They could judge when would be good fisheries and when to take so many fish and when to back off because they knew to, because of weather conditions and wind and different other environmental factors, they knew a population would be possibly declining and they would not harvest as much. But they were very able to, using these, um, these cues to understand time and changes in the life cycles around them, able to sustainably harvest um, the uh, fish that they needed. And so these are, you know, I'm continuing on these examples of um, land-based cultures that have adapted through protracted observation and really um, looked closely and learned to listen to the land at what it was um, giving them cues for on how to manage it. For one, to ensure the sustained harvest of the, in this case, the fisheries, but also as to look at a way to um, manage um, humans interacting with their, um, with their environment and with nature to, to be able to obtain the food they need but also to be um, helping enhance the environment and helping support the life cycles of different organisms, including fish. So it's an, another example of reciprocity and humans um, working with the environment in a positive way. And that's a lot of what permaculture promotes too. Again, that's why we're looking at these case studies to learn the lessons from these. And sometimes some of the methods can be reapplied into different landscapes, but they're in a similar way. This is simply a set of maps to show you the position of Palau um, in the South Pacific and um, a couple of renderings of um, other maps of the site and the fisheries that are in the shallow areas. Our fourth example comes from Peru, high up in the mountains in the Andes Mountains, um, really from 8,000 to 12,000 feet in elevation. Uh, these indigenous Peruvian Andes people have lived for thousands of years. Um, it's well documented that they have grown over 4,000 varieties of um, heirloom, we would call them, um, potatoes, different, different varieties for over 8,000 years. And this is high elevation, rocky, not the best soil, it's pretty cold up there at times, but they have found a way to, um, to produce food um, for a long, long time. And so when you look at something that's been done this long in one habitat, um, and also done organically, they don't, you know, not really because they're trying to be organic, like in the marketing sense, just the fact that they do not have a place to bring in a lot of extra stuff, that these people in general don't have money to buy pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers. So it's pretty natural, um, and but it's been able to be done for a long, long period of time. One of the methods they use is, that's definitely something that permaculture and other people can pick up and utilize as a method is terracing. So it's a rocky area, so they take a lot of the rocks and consolidate them into these rock walls, which hold back soil and make these more flat terraces, which is better for farming in. And those terraces also, um, like the gabions that we talked about earlier in water management, they, um, they prevent erosion. So as the water comes from the sky, precipitation, it starts to go down the hill, but it will, these, um, these terraces will catch the soil that's brought by the water's erosion and catch the water and hold it in there. And so these beds have built up over millennia. Some of these beds are thousands of years old with these terraces. So 
they are um, they have worked very well in this climate to produce these potato varieties and sustain the people. Just a really colorful picture of uh, one family of um, Peruvian people harvesting the potatoes in um, their traditional clothing. And just a, a close-up shot of a, a few of the, like I said, thousands of different cultivars of potatoes that come out of that region. Amazing, um, again, agricultural bounty and diversity from a very harsh environment, um, even a short growing season. Part of the reason that these Peruvian indigenous um, people living here have been able to do that is because of their very intimate and detailed knowledge of climatic and weather conditions. As I mentioned in the climate lecture, these people that live up in the Peruvian Andes and grow these potatoes often, and other people in the same region, even at lower elevations, have spent quite a bit of time looking at the constellation Pleiades. And because of the varying distances of the stars in that constellation, um, it's very easy to compare different um, levels of, of water vapor in the atmosphere. So the farmers will look up at that often and over hundreds and even thousands of years have looked to the stars and especially this constellation to understand the long-term weather vapor patterns in the atmosphere, which indicate to them the type of weather long-term patterns that are coming. For example, I mentioned before, these people were able to, are able to accurately predict the coming and going of El Nino and La Nina events, which very much influenced their harvest and planting times. And uh, again, protracted and thoughtful observation. This is indigenous science. It's the same thing as science. It's just done in a less formal way and not recognized as that. But this is why in permaculture, we start with observation. There's so much that our bodies it, with our senses can um, learn about our environment and learn to respond and work with that we're trained in our Western culture to ignore and um, look for abstracted outside information to understand our environment when so much of it can already be understood by ourselves. I, I would bet, this is just my opinion, if you take any of us and throw us down on a, you know, a deserted area um, and you know, there's ability to, to produce, make a living there and eat, that you know, over um, 10 years, you would learn so much about that. If you had to get your food from the land, you would learn um, to understand the seasons, you'd understand the comings and goings of birds that indicate the weather that's coming, you'd understand more about the soil, you would just pay attention. A lot of our senses that um, would be enlivened and we would start to remember how to understand the natural world much better as we have for thousands and thousands of years. And only recently in the last maybe couple hundred years have humans kind of forgotten these, um, this kind of intimate knowledge that we have of nature. Next, we have the traditional Hawaiian sustainable polyculture called Ahupua'a. And it's still being used a little bit in the Hawaiian Islands, but it used to be the, um, the way that the people there, the, the indigenous Hawaiians, um, got all you know, their farming and food um, and resource use on those islands. It's a system that um, each family or group of families formed a small um, village would have uh, a slice of the island. If you think of a typical volcanic island, it's conical and somewhat, you know, circular. Um, in this Ahupua'a system, the, the small um, village or group of families would have um, a piece of land that went from the top of the island, kind of, like I said, in a triangular slice, all the way down to the ocean narrow at the top, widening at the bottom. And um, at the very top of all the Hawaiian islands are the most forested areas in general. And at the bottom, you have the ocean and beaches and more lowland volcanic soils and steeper and more forested as you go back up. So um, the higher areas were the places where water catchment occurred because you have the forested areas and you have a higher elevation, it would catch more of the rainfall, and then you have water coming down in creeks all the way to the ocean. And um, the, the tallest top part of this system 
um, was considered a taboo forest. Only the spiritual leaders and wild animals and plants um, were allowed to live there um, up at the very top. And that's why it was taboo. People aren't supposed to, to venture in there unless they were you know, one of those special spiritual leaders or it was a wild animal. And that was the, the water source, water that fed their agriculture lower down and, um, and also gave water to the people came out of that. So in a sense, I really like this one because it speaks to the kind of the, the blending of um, values and ethics with spirituality. So the taboos, to enter the taboo forest was, was um, you know, it was against the rules and you shouldn't do it and it was spiritually wrong to do it. Um, and that was also, though that had an ecological base to it, is that it, people going into that could damage the watershed, damage and the forest there that was their source of water that they were completely dependent upon for fresh water. So um, it protected that resource and making it um, ecologically and culturally and spiritually taboo was a way to ensure that they would um, always have what they needed. Here's an overhead view of the different family units um, inhabiting those different areas. So you get you see different little slices of land going from the ridge line or the uppermost high elevation parts of Oahu down to the coast. And um, in those is where those are, those are individual watersheds. And because they were um, ecologically distinct as watersheds, they also were inhabited by those family um, groups, the moku in those areas. And that's where the production of the food for that, the, that family group or village um, received their, their resources. And that's the, uh, where they got their water from the very top. It came down in a creek into that little watershed. So again, ecologically and culturally intertwined types of resource units. So in each of those Ahupua'a systems, water would flow down from the taboo forest down into the first, um, the next lowest area would be um, the taro ponds. So that would be the area where the water was put into these ponds where these um, tuberous plants were grown and they're aquatic plants. They can be in the, just in on terrestrial soil too, but mostly they were grown aquatically they produce these huge starchy tubers that is just a staple to the culture of the Hawaiians. They make poi from it, the taro plants. And um, within those were polycultures. Though. These ponds with taro would also have um, other plants in them growing. There, were, there would be fish and mollusks, all which were food sources. And those taro ponds were usually the highest up, right under the water source, right under the taboo forest. So they were high up enough to be more protected from like the major brunt of ocean storms that, that um, had their biggest impact right along the coast. They're, so if they're up higher, they're a little more protected. Down below that would be the villages. The food source and the water source would be right above them. So if you were a villager in ancient Hawaii, which really wasn't that long ago, even like just 150 years ago, you would be walking up with your empty um, you know, vessel filling it up in the pond or the, the creek, the water source, and walking down with a full vessel. So that makes a lot of you know, energetic sense too. So you're not walking uphill with something full. Also, all the um, human manure or waste from the humans, even the green waste for in their village would be used to fertilize lower lands just below the village. So again, taboo forest at the top, village site, excuse me, taboo forest at the top, taro, ponds next, village right below that, and then other um, lower elevation agriculture, sometimes more taro ponds that they weren't, they weren't as critical to their food source would be the lower. And then sometimes these coastal orchards of things like coconut palms and other things that they would sometimes were called sacrificial forests, meaning if a storm came, they could be sacrificed and the villagers would still have the taro and the mollusks, mollusks and the fish from the higher elevation taro ponds and those lower elevation ones could be sacrificed and the people would still have a, a food source and water source. But then even outside um, off of the land, you can see um, in that those pictures, there's a little, a little bit of a ring outside into the ocean. There were um, mariculture ponds, so they would take the coral rocks and build up um, 
walls within the tidal pools to catch and raise fish and um, shellfish and seaweed and grow other things in the ocean itself. So it was a really intricate and rich, diverse system. Um, and it fed that whole community within that Ahupua'a area, that one watershed. This slide is showing you on the left is what I've been talking about, kind of the, the older ancient system. And then it slowly changed to plantation system when Europeans came and it started, and especially when it became a state of the United States and we started growing a lot of sugarcane there. And um, then um, during the Green Revolution and then genetic modification of, of plants and crops, it's become much more of a pesticide based and seed based system than it used to be, which was more perennials and some natives and more intricate. So there are um, some people that are trying to revitalize these old Ahupua'a systems, and they are, there are some examples of it on, on the islands here and there. This is one little kind of collage made up of one place on the islands where the system is being revitalized. And you look at the very um, top picture, they're showing you the, the water source that's coming out of the high elevation sacred forest. And right below that, it's going into taro ponds. People are replanting these old ponds that can often still be found left over from 150 years ago. And then the coastal, um, uh, right at the very bottom image, the, the coastal orchard, they're showing you some coconuts and other things that are found in that more um, Americulture system right at the bottom of the ocean, right at the bottom of the mountain and right at the edge of the ocean. So another really good example of polyculture and something that can be useful thinking about permaculture and um, trying to push our efforts more towards this type of system for sustainability. Um, another case study is in Sweden agriculture um, that's traditional to West Africa. And this is the old system of basically slash and burn. Small plots within the matrix of the wild forest would be cleared and um, burned and uh, cropped and then left to be for a couple of years and then left fallow for quite a bit of time. So a little more detail on this system, which is not used much anymore, if at all. It's, it's um, more of a kind of historical, uh, agroecological and sustainable system used in West Africa. But um, two acre plots of the tropical forest would be cleared at the beginning of the dry season, and they would cut the trees down in shrubs and let them dry out for a while. And then right before the rains came, um, they would burn it and then the rains would um, help soak all those nutrients in the ash back into the soil and um, and the soil would have some fertility because it had never been farmed or hadn't been farmed a long time and then those nutrients that were um, put back into the soil from the burning would enrich the soil and then they would crop it um, they would plant a polycultural system that had 20 to 40 different species all in the same field and get lots of food and um, the open area would provide hunting grounds. So that would be a great place for a small family unit um, or a number of families, you know, 10 to 15 people could live there for a few years and get their food. After a couple of years though, the soil fertility would start to um, plummet. And tropical soils are typically not high in nutrients. You have everything gets um, grows so fast all year long that all the nutrients and carbon is in the vegetation itself. It doesn't get time to build up in the soil. So after a couple of years um, in this slash and burn system, um, the soils would start to not be very good and you would, the productivity and the yields and the harvest would get low and the village would be moved. So it would move um, the minimum of five um, hectares away and be repeated. That process would be repeated. They would clear it um, during the dry season, burn it right before the rains came, crop it for two years, and then move again. Um, the soils are in, in these, this area in general in West Africa are pretty acidic, so they can handle um, this ash 
um, after the fire and not be too, you know, the pH didn't get too uh, askew. So what they would do is um, in this old system, it would take about 14 iterations of this whole process. And the village would um, keep moving, always moving. I think I said five hectares. I meant to say five um, acres. So they'd have a two acre plot and then they would move at least five acres away for the next two acre plot. So there had to be a lineal distance um, of five acres between those two plots. And they would do it again every two years for 14 different iterations. So after 28 years, 14 different two acre plots, all five acres away from each other, they would then be able to go back to the very first plot because it had had 28 years to heal. It was basically fallow for that whole time and um, the forest regenerated the soils regenerated and it was ready to be farmed again and they could keep doing this over and over as long as they moved those distances uh, approximately, um, farmed approximately just two acres and took all that time in between before reusing the same piece of land. So why did that system work? Why aren't we doing that now? It sounds really good. Well, there's a few reasons it worked that would be hard to implement now. First of all, those villages were small. There weren't too many people that were being supported by the two acres. Um, they only used hand tools, no power tools. And I, I think I've mentioned this before, but that puts the rate of regrowth. So the ability of the ecosystem to grow back and heal has a certain rate to it, depends on the type of ecosystem. Um, but that when humans just use hand tools, it's it puts our ability to destroy or deconstruct or deforest that um, tropical rainforest at the same rate that it can um, regenerate similar rates. In other words, the scale is more similar. If you bring in power tools, we could clear so much forest that the, it wouldn't be able to regenerate that big of an area that quickly. Another part that's closely linked to what I just said is that these small two acre plots were um, a small blemish or clearing in the greater context of a healthy, older tropical forest. So when that first two acre plot was abandoned um, and they moved on, you have a lot of older trees, mature and, and shrubs and animals that could um, send their seeds. You know, their seeds could fly in on their own on the wind or on animals and get back into help restore that two acre scar on the land. Um, and that is one way that these plots regenerated more quickly. Um, if you had too much of a cleared area, it would take a lot more to get that the center of that area regenerated. And um, that's part of it. That's part of how it worked. So the disturbance rates um, by humans within that small scale were similar to the regeneration rates. Um, also, the edge is utilized. Um, that's really important. Ecological edges have a lot of fertility. And so those edges are the ones that are producing the seeds and propagules that will go in and reseed and regenerate that cleared plot after it's done. And again, we talked about succession, or I did, um, and the West Africans knew about that. They knew they could keep resetting that forest ecosystem and letting it come back again, but they had to wait those 28 to 30 years. Um, or it wouldn't work. If they came back sooner, it would, it would start to degrade and the system would not recover and regenerate well at all. And you would have, you know, downward spiral. And the population overall was much smaller in the greater region. And right now we don't have that big of wide, huge areas of undisturbed forest to, to um, clear these little plots in and support little villages. There's just widespread uh, deforestation. So this can't really be implemented anymore. But the ideas and concept can be re-implemented on smaller scales in small ways. The last of our examples, these case studies, which I think is really kind of cool, it comes from the ancient Aztecs. They had these agroecosystems called chinampas, and they um, were in the vast wetland area that surrounded Mex what is now Mexico City, um, and through really very um, ingenious methods, the Aztecs would take some of these wetlands and they would make islands of land within the waterlogged areas in which they, on which they grew crops and 
produce food for themselves. So imagine a big, big wetland that was a huge area. There were a lot of problems with, of course, um, things like malaria, which they didn't even know it was malaria back then, but with the, with the Aztec people because there were so many wetlands around Mexico City. Um, but they, these were, you know, fairly unproductive for humans, but they figured out how they could take um, willows and cottonwoods and other types of trees that could grow with their roots in the water plant them um, in a line and weave other types of reeds and um, sticks in between them to build kind of like a, a basket wall in the mud and then take mud from, you can see here in the picture, take it from the, the water from the bottom underneath there and put it and fill those baskets, these long um, three to six meter wide islands where they would take the mud from the bottom of the wetland and put it into the those little islands and build them up until it was above ground soil. And you can, these trees that are growing out of the edges were original for when they were just used as sticks poked in the side to build those kind of basket-like um, retaining walls and to build these. And they would grow crops on those and use canoes between, um, the, in the canals in between the islands to do harvesting and cultivating. So it was a lot easier. I mean, imagine pull, having a horse pull up or a oxen pull a plow through soil. There's so much more friction than a boat skimming along to um, plant things and harvest. And um, it's just a lot easier way to move things around. They would um, also raise fish in the canals and shellfish and other fish, and sometimes trellised over the canals, growing vines and things where they grew more food. So um, these were polycultural, really rich agro ecosystems. Um, uh, and uh, some of them still survive today in a town called um, Xochimilco outside of Mexico City. They're kind of like a tourist attraction. Um, so you can visit um, some remnants of them. Um, another really neat thing about these two is not just that they were an agro-ecosystem, they were a cultural, social system. These were places people would go and buy. It was like a farmer's market, you know, a, uh, on water. Um, but also a social event to go to these and get their food and take their canoe around and talk to different people, the different farmers, the different plots of land. Um, so it was really a community kind of coagulant too. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah, go check out the Chinampas um, in Xochimilco outside of Mexico City if you ever get a chance. And last, I just want to mention this book that I um, use. It's called Sacred Ecology. And these are case studies. Some of the ones I just talked to you about in this lecture are from this book. Um, most of them are not, but there's a lot of case studies of indigenous peoples all over the world that have ecological systems built into their culture, which are considered sacred, um, meaning spiritual and ecological woven together and very sustainable. They're not all ones that we could take and try to re-implement in our world, but they all have um, a, well, let's see, let me say a um, recognition that our, um, our land uh, needs to be worked with. And when we don't work with it, we humans will have problems. These land-based cultures, as I said, you and I would be the same. It's not that indigenous people are somehow smarter. It's just that they had to be, to learn from the land and respond to it creatively and learn and remember over generation and generation, they honed their knowledge to, um, to make sure their systems were sustainable. And so can we. And we might not be able to jump there quickly from taking one permaculture class, but we can start thinking that way about responding to what is around us and maybe what the, the, your site is telling you by looking at what's happening with the water and the erosion and the wildlife, um, but also looking at the people. How are they responding to the situation? What you've set up, uh, the landscape or the social system, is it working? Um, we do that all the time in our human relationships. We'll, we'll notice what's working or not working. I mean, you, you notice like when your friend gives you a weird frown look when you say something they don't like, and it's the same thing but it's reapplying it to the, to the landscape and to the natural world. And I say reapply, it's because we've, as humans, 
have listened and looked at and observed the land um, very closely for much, much longer than we've ignored it. It's only recently that we had the luxury of kind of ignoring it, but um, it's important that we start listening again.